responders. Much of those discussions had focused on this funding issue. And for many, they had uh, this kind of narrow, narrow view that localization is just all about more direct funding to local and national acts, more um, a transformative, especially uh, in the perspective of local actors themselves, is this notion of reinforcing rather than replacing, agreeing on the concept of who is local and national. Uh, this should not be uh, confused with locally led response because that is already happening, it's been happening, and it's delivering results. Localization is for the international system to recognize, to respect, and support this locally led uh, responses. So that localization. So the way we see localization is not only through uh, funding opportunities or funding tracks, but basically to have the dialogue and the engagement between local actors, donors, and, uh, and aid organization is taking place. And being able to monitor and deal with big funds, deal with communities, it does require a, a stronger accountability and compliance. And this is where we need the experience of international NGOs and aid organization in helping us develop those, uh, those compliance mechanisms. Because what staff constantly change because they get a much more competitive salary and benefits from other organizations that for us is very difficult to retain. And whenever a staff has the capacity to actually deliver and be able to actually be managing the work uh, pretty well, we end up losing the staff. So not just support organization directly, but maybe help us to find the support that we need. Mm -hmm. And not just give money in a way that it is localization, but also open doors to influence donors. When we started the project, we were addressing the imbalance that does exist in the humanitarian system and acknowledging that it is currently skewed in favor of international organizations, um, looking at uh, transforming the humanitarian agenda by shifting uh, power to local organizations, and local here being primarily national, so a facilitation of affected voice to be had. Really, when you're talking about who leads and who makes the decision, if our role as organizations, whether national or international, is not going to facilitate the voice of those affected to be had, I believe we, would, we then are not taking forward um, localization. How are local communities, national organizations being supported, or are they sitting in those spaces where the coordination of humanitarian work is um, being discussed and decisions being made? About using our representational role as international organizations to give space to national organizations. What commitments are we making as we come to international forums? Where local organizations, national organizations are were facilitated and supported to identify their capacities and also the support that was required. And now started the discussion with the international organizations. This is where you'd like us to, we'd like you to support us. This is a journey that we'd like to go through. Communities who are most vulnerable to crisis and disasters have the power to determine and lead on their own response. They are best placed to hold government to account and, and We wanted to explore what the coordination system should be doing to help that process as well. And this is the sort of the, the summary of what we what we discovered. And how the coordination system can ensure that local partners have an influence over the strategic direction of the humanitarian system. Why we need to ensure that local partners can influence the discussions because they're the ones that the cluster is ultimately um, representing. But in terms of civil society, there's only one in the whole world that has a national NGO leading at the, at the national level. In child protection, there's not even a single one. And we very rarely see examples of coaching, mentoring, uh, embedding staff in, in local, uh, local and national NGOs, joint implementation. We understand the importance of a visible and a, and, a, and a rallying point, but almost everyone that I've spoken to has told me that they don't care where the money comes from. They don't care if it drops out of the sky, if it comes through 49 layers. What they care about is when they get the money, they're able to make decisions about how to use it. <laughs> I could find very few examples um, of where a national NGO is able to receive uh, an indirect budget line. If they don't have that, they can't retain their staff, which we heard about this morning. They can't fix their laptop, which means that they can't do the data collection, which they're, they're expected to do. 
you know, they can't have seed funding to start a project to create um, a bit of credibility and, and prove that they can do it. They can't do their capacity building. There's a lot of structural change that we need to make, and that's going to be very difficult to do <laughs> if we continue to have these very pervasive um, assumptions and, and, in a lot of ways, double standards. So, um, but actually, defining and assessing capacity um, is quite difficult. What is meant by local in local capacity is unclear, as we've discussed already. Um, capacity is not systematically defined in the literature on humanitarian action or in practice. It is also critical to recognize that in how capacity is defined, there are um, these different elements and of power dynamics, um, which has led in some way to assumptions around capacity. And that is that international actors have capacity and that local actors lack the capacity. That indeed is not just about who has capacity and who lacks capacity, but it's about how you um, have this capacity combined and how they interact with each other. We also saw generally capacity understood less as the ability to uh, deliver effective responses to effective people and more concerned with engaging with the international system. That we're not seeing a shift currently toward a more complementary response. It's important to mention government today, as I think in a lot of these discussions, the role of the host government kind of risks getting a little bit lost. Bangladesh is a really interesting example of where the grand bargain is being used by local and national actors, basically as a stick to beat internationals over their head with and say, look, these are a set of commitments that you guys signed up to. And you know, using the language of the grand bargain to, 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 to drive a more localized response, being ultimately responsible and accountable to different groups of people. So local NGOs in both contexts feel a real sense of responsibility and also a sense of pressure from their host communities. And international actors to an extent feel this as well, but they're also more accountable to donors and they want local organizations to be um, accountable to them. What